Welcome, and thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. We want you to fully engage with us, so feel free to gather your family, invite a friend, or if you're alone, we trust that you'll have a wonderful worship experience with us today. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to our service today. I'd like to welcome you to stand to your feet if you haven't already done so, and if you're able to, to join us as we open up in worship this morning. Have your way, Father God, in our lives as we worship you through song, Father. You're a great God. You're a wonderful God. As we worship you, Father, have your way in our hearts, Father. Bring change, Father. Every lyric, Father, let it resonate in our hearts. Change in us from the inside out, Father. Let every word be your word, Father. Every action that we do, Father, let it be to worship your name. We thank you, Father. And salvation whom shall I fear of whom shall I be afraid the Lord is my light and salvation whom shall I fear of whom shall I be afraid I will wait on you
goodness of the Lord. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the do all things in your name we thank you Jesus we let our praises rise
spirit of worship and ask you guys to spend a little bit of time reflecting on how God would have you give towards his kingdom work. We have five ways to give um, here at Commitment. The first way is via the church website, via the church app. You can give uh, to one of our giving stations. Uh, we have one here in the front of the sanctuary and also one in the foyer. Or you can give your offering to one of the greeters on your way out. And lastly, we offer text to give. So you can text one word, Commitment Church, to 77977. At this moment, I'd like to pray over you guys and pray over this offering. And also pray over our prayer walls. So if we could all just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you again for all that you do for us all that you do for us undeservedly. At the end of the day, we deserve death and you just continue to give us life, Father. 
Father, I pray that you supply for the needs of this ministry. Lord, you know what needs to be done and you know what it costs it for that to be done, Father. And I just pray that you provide it, Lord. Provide for your people, Lord, abundantly, well beyond what we can imagine, Father, so that we may know that the only source of anything comes from you. I pray, Father, that you, um, you be with the people who have put their petitions on our prayer walls. And Father, I pray that where healing is required, that you heal. I pray, Father, that where comfort is required, you comfort. I pray, Father, that you just move inside of the hearts of your people and bring them to you, Father. God, I pray this in all things in Jesus' name. your name oh we praise your name
If you could just stay where you are, just to reflect right now, if you could. Many times we walk in and we're heavy. We, we carry the weights of life, the failures of life. And, and the challenge is, it's almost like, okay, what do I have? Or what reason do I have to praise you? What reason do I have to be thankful? to the Lord if we could just pause right now and just gather ourselves gather our hearts gather our minds and just lay the weights of the world down at his feet the scripture says and Jesus says cast all of your cares upon him because he first cared for you So whatever that care is today, can you just, just lay it at his feet? Sometimes cares come in the shape of good stuff. You know, the weights of responsibility. Maybe the anticipation of something that you're just waiting for an answer, waiting for a response. There could be some that are waiting for a, a medical report. Could be waiting for a, a decision, you know, for uh, the next step, the next phase in your life, in your family's life. He wants all of it. Just whatever that is today, just name it by name. Just say, God, I give you this. Maybe it's a person that you need to release and say, Lord, uh, just my concern for them is just wearing me out. then let's let's change let's just change our hearts towards this direction now because the scripture says in Philippians 4 it tells us to think on good things those things that are lovely those things that are pure that of good reputation good report can you just think about something good that God has done in your life and just thank him like God let my praise arise from the inside because of. And today, maybe you can't find anything, but here's the deal. If you have put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you have something. If you were once a sinner on your way to hell, you're no longer that person. You may not be perfect. You may not be exactly where you know he wants you to be, but you're not the same. Amen? Just thank him today. Thank him for that, that thing, that, that move of his spirit, that affirmation of his Holy Spirit, that confirmation, if you would, that place to celebrate the goodness of God. Father, we thank you because in spite of it all, in spite of the pains, in spite of the frustrations, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the fears, the trepidations, the insecurities, in spite of life or death or any created thing, Father, we know that your love supersedes this, that, God, your love 
is deeper than the deepest ocean. It is higher than the highest mountain. It is broader than anything on this earth, oh God. And we thank you today for your, your, the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ, and your unconditional, unadulterated, your love that is immeasurable and it never ceases, that is the same today, that it will, uh, to yesterday, today, and forever. And it never, ever ends, God. Your love for us never ends. And Father, I pray against the enemy today who will try to bring a, a heaviness on your people, God, a, a, just a weight on your people. And I pray, oh God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, oh Lord, that you will lift it from their shoulders, oh God, that you, they will cast it upon you, my God, because they care for you, because you care for them, oh God, and they love you. Father, we adore you. God, we thank you so much, and we celebrate you from the inside. God, God, I pray in the name of Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that God, that you would give your people the strength, oh Lord, to endure your strength to live victoriously. Your, the strength, oh God, to praise victoriously, because God, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And God, that your word promises, oh God, that Satan is defeated and darkness is dispelled because Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And we celebrate Jesus today. We glorify Jesus today. And we pray you, Jesus, would take center stage on our hearts in the magnificent name of Jesus Christ. We all say amen. Hallelujah. Let's bless this name. We glorify your name today. We glorify your name today. We glorify your name today. For you are the King of kings. And you're the Lord of lords. And there's no one greater than you, Jesus. We bless your name. Amen. Come on, let's clap our hands together and celebrate him. Lost in shame, could not get past my plane until he called my name. I'm so glad he changed me, darkness of me.
All right, all right. This is kiss time. Good morning. Good morning. Man, I know it's one of those mornings, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, it's good to see everyone, and we thank you so much for being here if this is your first time, and we're excited to continue a, a sermon series uh, that I've entitled for you, Not Yet, but just to remind you that uh, October the 25th, right, everybody kind of knows what's going on, there's a prayer gathering here. That is not only for us, but it's for your friends, family, strangers, anyone who knows Christ. Uh, maybe people who don't know Christ, they can come and, and experience what God's going to do in our midst to just seek the Lord. And that's going to be from 7 to 8.30. It's a Tuesday evening, okay? So October what? 25th. All right, good. Awesome. So let's pray and ask God for help today. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here <clears throat> in your presence, to worship you, to just be impacted by you in whatever creative way you desire. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would now help me to help your people as we look into your word to understand from you, the great rabbi. So Father, I pray that you will come and do what you do best first in my heart that all the distractions and barriers that may hinder me from communicating a clear message and uh, your people hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd, I pray that you remove that now. And God, I pray also that you prepare the hearts of your people, that the hearts will be tilled and, and ready and prepared to receive uh, the word of God, the seed of the word of God, that it may fall on good ground and bear much fruit. So Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do. And we're so honored to just have the privilege to learn from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So if you're going to buy, open your Bibles again to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, beginning verse number one, it says, Jesus left the temple area and was going on his way when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. But he responded and said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Verse 4 says, And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will mislead many people. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Verse 7 says, For nations will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will hand you over to tribulation and kill you. And you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, many will fall away. And they will betray one another and hate one another. And we're going to pick up here in verse 11 today. And many false prophets will rise up. And mislead many people. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. As we've been learning in this series is that there's going to be many signs. There's going to be much purging. There's going to be much purifying that is necessary within the church. Within uh, the lives of those who are following Christ. And matter of fact, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, right? That's his promise. He's going to send an angel, and he's going to hand, handle all of that. It's not our responsibility. Remember, we learned that. It's not yours and my responsibility to purge and purify people. That is the Spirit's responsibility. But then here's the challenge. 
in all of this, it's going to manifest in much wickedness. And, and some of you, of course, will agree that we see tons of wickedness going on today. But what I like to say always in this series is that it's going to get worse. So right now, if you're, if you're blowing a gasket, if you would, based upon what's happening today, man, I don't know what's going to happen to you once it really jumps off. Right? Right? Once it really, really gets, you know, hairy, what and how are you going to respond? And that's why what we're learning in this series is that, no, it's not yet time. Yeah, we're feeling the contractions, which I don't know how that feels, mothers. <laughs> you know, feeling the pain, feeling the contractions, they're coming. The, you know, the baby is about to arrive, but not yet. And remember, we've learned as well, not even the son of God knows the time he's coming back, which is so, so like God, right? He says, listen, please underscore everyone that even the son who's supposed to be on his way doesn't even know when he's coming. Only the father does, which really seals it in the authority of God, that it's going to be his decision on when, when the end needs to happen, not anyone's decision at all. But our challenge is, is not to overreact to these things. Right? Not to overreact when nation rises up against nation. Sounds familiar? It's not to overreact when we see floods and, and you know, uh, the changing of the seasons, which is another uh, description of his end. It's nothing to overreact about. But our challenge is to become men and women who stay on mission with Christ. Because at the end of the day, if we want him to come back, we're going to learn next week that there's only one thing we can do to help him come back sooner than later. But before we get there, our challenge is to stay on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ, tell as many people as we can, and or at worst, listen, live like you know. In other words, live like you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ so that the world can see the transformational work in your life and desire this Jesus that we all serve and follow. Amen? But the question today I want to answer, or at least one of them is this, is what will this, what will this wickedness look like? Or you could say it this way, why will there be so much wickedness among us? Why? Why will there be so much wickedness it's pretty clear here if we look at number one, verse 11. It starts clearly with this flagrancy of false prophets. And I'm sure you can, you can put your, your finger on a few that are lurking around today. There's this flagrancy of this false prophets. False prophets simply in, in this uh, verse means this. One acting the part of a divinely inspired prophet. One who's acting the part. Sounds like it. Looks like it, smells like it, moves like it, but still not. You see, here's the reality. You see, in the Old Testament, this is what happens to false prophets. And false prophets were categorized this way. If you're 99.9% .9 accurate, you are a false prophet. If you're 99.9% .9 accurate... You're a false prophet. You have to be 100% accurate to be a prophet of the most high God. And that's why th this is so important to understand, especially if you and I are prophetically speaking for God, if you would. If we are being oracles of God, one thing is for sure, doubly for sure, to make sure that you're not fitting in the 99.9% .9 category. Stick with Jesus. Don't get caught up in all the hype of trying to connect the dots and, and say, okay, well, this is why and, and, and this is when and, and, and all the, follow me, the, all the narratives that take place, right? It, woe is us if we don't preach Jesus. Amen. So to stay in the safe lane, Jesus. Who can get bored with Jesus? Who could think that there should be something else said but Jesus? 
So false prophets ultimately feel as though there's something else to be added other than Jesus. There's no other answer but Jesus. And that's why in Mark chapter 13, verse 21 through 23, Jesus gives this harsh warning. He says this, and then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there, uh, look, there he is, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and will provide signs and wonders in order to mislead. If possible, the, even the elect. But listen to what he says in verse 23. But beware, I have told you everything in advance. So he's already warned us. He says, listen, I'm telling you in advance, this is what's going to happen. So be alert. Be alert and understand there will be false prophets. And therefore, there has to be this awareness. There has to be this vetting out. Listen, who you're watching on TV who you're listening to on the radio, what podcast you've downloaded, and even what you're saying yourself. But here's the beauty of it. God can handle it because there's going to be consequences. And Galatians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 gives the consequences of the false prophet. It says, there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So understand what is being said. So if anyone around you, or if we ourselves, or even an angel in heaven comes to you with a message other than Jesus, God's going to handle it. And that's why my, my personal opinions, you know, and this is just my personal opinion, so it's not the gospel, but it's this. I personally am not going to waste time debating people who are already know in error. I'm not going to give God's precious time in this context to give the enemy credit of someone who already know is an error. Nor would I give and waste God's precious time of trying to convince other people that who you're watching, who you're looking at, who you're listening to, who you've download are in error. It's not my job. So far as it depends on me, Scripture says in Romans 12, live at peace with all men. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He's going to handle it. You follow me? So not yet. Don't get twisted about all this stuff is going on. It's not your job to defend Christ. Let God handle it. Just work at being lights and salt and sweet smelling aroma so that when, listen, when truth is lined up with fiction, they see truth in you and see lies in others because how you conduct yourself in the midst of wickedness. Make sense? Time is precious. Let God handle it. Verse 11 also shows us that false prophets distort the gospel, right? And ultimately, it will cause so many of us to become misled. The word misled means this, to cause, to stray to lead away from the right way or the truth, to lead into error, to deceive, to sever from the truth. And I'm sure you could probably put your finger on someone that you know who's been severed from the truth, and they're now following some other form of the gospel. But listen to what 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the first part of verse 3, describes how many will be misled. It says, but false prophets also appeared among the people, just as there will, be, there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master, capital M, who bought them. Which say, says to you, it's people who were going the right way 
bought by the master, but now deceiving them, those who follow the master, capital M. Bringing swift destruction upon themselves. You hear that? So even though they're introducing destructive heresies, they're bringing about upon themselves what? Swift destruction. Which says again, let God do what? Handle it. Verse 2, many will follow their indecent behavior, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. Didn't say ended, didn't say done away with, but it will hurt it in some way. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. False prophets would distort the gospel, causing many to be misled. Here's a third reason why there will be so much wickedness. You find also in verse 12 is that this non-truth will always lead to lawlessness. Will always lead to lawlessness. The word lawlessness means this. It is a condition without the law because of ignorance of it. So I believe that gives some space to people eventually getting it. You follow me? There just be ignorance that people would do stupid stuff, say stupid stuff like I've done in time in times past. And it's because of ignorance. Just don't know. But that mean you're you're right. <laughs> you could be you're ignorant, but you're still wrong. You follow me? It's not, oh, I'm ignorant now, but I'm right. No, ignorant, but wrong. OK, <laughs> and that's important to underscore because of they're violating the law. But here's the deal. Think about this. When you look at every sporting event or every sport on the face of this planet, there's something that is universal to them all. There's lines on the field, lines on the court. And if you're going to play in this game, you got to play within the lines. So, in other words, God is saying, here's the lines, church. Here's the line, people, sinners and saints. And, and I don't care what you do and how you do it, what you say, what you don't say. I'm not going to move the lines because of you. I'm not going to move the lines because now you're, you know, you're having a tough game. I'm not going to widen the goalpost because last time you kicked, it was off left. Right, I'm not going to move the, the putting cup because last time you blew it on the last hole. Right? I'm not going, you follow me, I'm not going to bring the free throw line closer because you, 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 your percentage is, is lower now. But that's how we try to navigate life, right? You know, human, human sinful tendency is, oh, it's a little tough, a little difficult, a little complex, a little confusing. Get the heat is on, right? Well, let me move the lines. And, and that's what I say to you and beseech you, why false prophets begin to cause this lawlessness. It's because really deep down inside, they're trying to discover really, really what is the truth. But sometimes truth is hard. Truth is complex. Truth God's truth is also like this. You don't need to know it all. Matter of fact, you would never know it all because we know in part, we understand in part, right? Make sense? So now there then begins this moving of the lines. I'm just going to, you know, tough game today, so, or I can't understand something, or I want to figure it out. Okay, so I'm just going to move stuff around to make sure it fits my narrative, my way of understanding, my way of dealing with it, my way of explaining it. No, if you can't explain it, just admit you can't explain it. Second Peter chapter 2 goes on to say this in verses 19, 9 through 19, but I'm going to skip through and won't read all of the verses, but please go back and read them on your own. It says, those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt passion and despise authority, you hear that? Part of this lawlessness and this false prophets, 
selfness, reckless, self-centered. They speak abusively of angelic majesties without trembling. Skip to verse 12. Plevis says, but these like unreasoning animals. <laughs> these like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed using abusive speech where they have no knowledge will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Verse 13, they are stains and blemishes reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. Do you hear that? Enticing unstable souls. Well, you know, when I grew up, the church did this to me, the church did that to me. So lo and behold, here comes these people knocking on your door. Oh, we'll come in and we'll tell you about the Bible. You're unstable. I don't care what you say. If you've been hurt by the church, hurt by uh, people of the church, hurt by leaders in the church, you're unstable. You've been hurt by mama, hurt by daddy. You're unstable. So all someone needs to do is whisper sweet nothings in your ear. And it's easy to believe it and follow it. And truth be told, we're all unstable. All, which includes me. And we just have to admit that we are unstable. And then, but stay where Jesus is and know that he is the only stability that you need. And you need no other stuff to make you stable but Christ and Christ alone. It's, it makes sense, right? Enticing unstable souls, we're back in verse 13, 2 Peter chapter 2, having hearts trained in greed, hearts trained in greed, accursed children abandoning the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the reward of unrighteousness. Skip to verse 18, please. It says, verse, verse 18 starts with, it says, For while speaking out arrogant words of no value, they entice by fleshly desires. They're hook. Well, you know, if you give, then God's going to... Everybody on this planet need money, for the record. So it's like, okay, so you follow me? It's like, oh, no, it's just enticing the flesh. Well, you give and God's going to. You do this and then God's going to give you that husband. And I know, listen, every single woman on the face of the planet wants a husband. You follow what I'm saying? It's like, what's prophetic about that? <laughs> I'm making light of something serious, right? But that's, that, that's, how, that's how it's hollow in words, but it hooks you with your what? Flesh. Where am I? <laughs> the, those who barely escape are from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom. You hear that? Promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what anyone is overcome, by this he is enslaved. Do you see the beauty of the word of God? If you just read it, it's like, oh, dang, that's my answer. <laughs> you follow me? It's like, oh, oh, okay, well, that's what I shouldn't do. It's just clear, crystal clear that a man or any created being doesn't need to add 
or take away from what is written, but that is the nature of a false prophet. Make sense? Lastly, you find in verse 12 as well, when there's no law to govern the heart, guess what happens? The heart naturally grows cold. Think about this. The scripture Jesus says, listen, Moses gave you a certificate of divorce because of the hardness of your heart. But don't, listen, don't. Proper exegesis of the scripture is define scripture with scripture. God also said in Malachi chapter 2, he hates divorce. So you can't throw the baby out the bathwater. You follow me? But he also says he forgives. You follow me? So you, you, you got to be able to say, okay, well, shucks, for my life, it's just not cut and dry. So if he says he hates it, that means I must do everything in my power in the counsel of others and the multitude of counsel to make sure it works. And making sure it works isn't, oh, it's about to fail, and then I ask for help. It's, no, in the midst of trying to be married, I'm going to ask for help. Once you separate it, hearts are cold. It just happens to the best of us. But then enters the greater grace of God that restores and redeems. That's the full narrative. That's the full story of the cross. Right? That he takes broken people and redeems them. You follow me? But yet, he's not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because be not deceived what a man sows. That's what he also shall reap. You sow in the flesh. In other words, you make bad decisions. You reap destruction. In other words, there are going to be consequences for actions, but yet still enters what? The grace of God that allows you to even navigate your bad decisions or the consequences of your bad decisions. Make sense? So that being said, the challenge is if you don't have the full law and counsel of God, guess what's going to happen to your heart? It's done. If someone is preaching to you, okay, well, if you do this, then God's going to give you that. And if you do this and God doesn't give you that, what's going to happen to your heart? Is this God really, is he real? Well, there's no law to govern the heart. The heart will naturally grow cold. The words grow cold means this. It's important. It means to be made cold. Every heart doesn't start cold. It's made cold. You see, when a woman gets married to a man, I believe most of the time that man has most of that woman's heart, if not all, depending on her childhood. He missteps, he loses the heart of the woman. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And that's why one of the complexities of marriage is the man has to always work diligently to keep his wife's heart soft. That's why he's the covering. It's not just one and done. It's not, I've won your heart. And then her heart's still going to be on fire. Nope, 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 nope. Especially into children, it'd be like, shucks, I thought I had your heart. It's like, I have none of your heart once kids come. And then you got to go in and win it back. You literally, guys, have to go back and win the heart back because your heart, her heart will grow cold towards you because her heart Sometimes it's inappropriately geared to the child, imbalanced. And the man has to work to woo the heart back. 
to keep it from growing cold. Make sense? All of our hearts are that way. I mean, a man, if he grows up and he's had a hard life, guess what he's going to have? He's going to grow to have a hard heart. If he's never seen a father with a tender but yet firm but yet strong heart, guess what he's going he's gonna, to he, He's going to go today. He's going to go one or the other. He's going to be soft, noodle heart. Just saying. Or he's going to be hard-hearted, thinking like that's really a man. Soft-hearted is he's acting like a woman. Not soft-hearted, noodle heart. You follow what I'm saying? It's, it's like, well, what direction do I go? Because I've never seen it exemplified in my life. A baby doesn't grow up or are born with a hard heart. It's nurtured. One way or the other. A baby Christian, same way. You may come in with a hard heart, but guess what God does over time? He softens it. He softens it over time. But how should we respond to this? What should we do? In each part of this series, we've been answering this question. What should we do? How should we respond? We know that there's going to be false prophets. We know it's going to be crazy. We know there's going to be people misled, and hopefully we're not part of that group being misled. We know there's going to be lawlessness. We know there's going to be hard hearts. Matter of fact, you may be living with someone with a hard heart, truth be told. What do we do? How do we respond to this? Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse number 23. You can go back and, again, later today and read verses 15 on, but I'm going to start for the sake of time at verse number 23. It says, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or he is over here, do not believe him. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and will provide great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, Jesus saying this again, so if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. Here's the first way we should respond. First of all, uh, not to be redundant, but we just cannot respond to the false Christ. We just cannot respond. We can't respond. We or will hear it. They will be in our face, especially with, with social media and, and all these other forms of technology. It will be blatantly in your face. Our challenge is we cannot respond. Now, remember, responding is either attacking them. Well, you're wrong, and you're this, and you're that, and you're posting all these things like you Jesus or something. <laughs> right? It's like, calm down. Calm down. Don't overreact. Secondly, don't respond by being lured. You follow me? Don't respond. So 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, commands us this, commands us to test the spirits. It says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, plural, to see whether they are from God. Now, the challenge is the only way you're going to be able to test the spirit is that, it, you know, from the authority of the God's word, but do you have the word of God in you so that the spirit of God can help you do what? Test the spirit. If you have nothing in you, you have nothing to gauge it. Nothing to gauge with what they're doing or not doing. Now, let me park here for a minute because I personally believe early on in our faith, when we come to know Jesus Christ, we're babies right? We're just so gullible and we just lap up any kind of food. I do believe by God's grace, he does a couple of things. One, some way, somehow, you just say things like this, but something ain't right there. It's like, you don't know how to explain it. 
you know, not articulated. You can't find chapter and verse, but something on the inside or someone on the inside is warning you. And you say, ah, something just don't, ain't right with that. I can't put my finger on it, but just something ain't right. I mean, you can just be hearing people's words. It, I, something doesn't sound right in that. It's the Spirit of God warning you. I believe on the flip side, there are some who are so thirsty and even I can probably say so gullible that they will follow after, but God will still protect because they belong to him and he's the good shepherd. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the Spirit, capital S, of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from whom? God. Again, if, if people are just skating around the gospel and everything you hear is everything but Jesus, it's like, who are you promoting? Why do we gather? Isn't it because of Christ? For Christ? Isn't Christ the head of us? So if everything you hear them say is like has nothing to do with the finished work of Jesus Christ, it's not, it's not propelled from, it's not pushing you back towards. You, red flag, red flag, red flag. Something's up with that. It's a narrative. If someone's always, listen, if someone's always teaching about the end times, well, I got to tell you about the end times and end times and end times. And, oh, let me tell you, it's going to happen, you know, uh, you know, 2050. Yeah, it's going to happen. <laughs> if there's a whole bunch of people who are saying things like that, well, the reality is, well, when are you going to tell me something about Jesus? Well, isn't Jesus like the main character? <laughs> you follow me? It, th that's how simple it is, but yet how tricky it is. Because it'll hook your emotions. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does look like the end times are coming. Oh, yeah, and then now you download and podcast, and now they brainwashing you because garbage in, garbage out. you renewing your mind with other stuff that isn't the word of God. Or they'll take part of it. Right? If it's all about wealth. And listen, I'm not telling you that wealth isn't from God. But if it's all about that, all about that, all about that, it's like, well, where's Jesus in all this? Where's honoring him with your wealth versus building a kingdom unto yourself? You follow me? It, it's just, it gets weird. It gets really, really weird. And it hurts a lot of people. So that if every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Anti or against Christ, which you have heard is coming, and now it is already in the world. It, it is already here. The word test means this to examine, prove, scrutinize, to see whether a thing is genuine or not. It is, it is as one is testing metals. That's our responsibility to test and make sure people are legit. Amen? And not responding also, second point, not responding also means, verse 26, is not going where he is. Do not go where he is. Paul warns Titus in uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 14 this way. And this was about the Cretans who were uh, a group of people who were, if you would, spiritual leaders of the day. But they were worshiping gods, plural, like Zeus. And the theme of Zeus, if you're Marvel kind of person and all that stuff. At the end of the day, Zeus was man becoming God. That's the whole thing of the Cretans. Is Zeus was man who became what? God. 
So this is what Paul warns. He says, for there are many rebellious people, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So in other words, you know, there are people who are teaching certain things, circumcision, uncircumcision, right? In other words, the circumcision really were people who were supposed to be for God because the circumcision was a law. Verse 11, it says, who must be silenced because they are upsetting the whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of dishonest gain. There's always dishonest gain at the end of the rainbow. Verse 12, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. <laughs> Verse 13, it says, this testimony is true. For this reason, reprimand them severely so that they may be sound in their faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. So, in other words, this is people that are close to you, if you would, close enough to be able to, you're thinking about going their way. There's going to be a time that you have to say, nope, not in this camp. And if you are disrupting, there's the door. Don't respond because they're going to take you somewhere you shouldn't be. Lastly, not responding means, in verse 26 again, not even believing what is said. So don't even go. Don't even believe the hearsay. You see the progression? Don't go. Don't even get to a point that you're like entertaining the words, which says uh, the word believe means this, to think to be true. Don't believe them. Don't be persuaded. Don't give them credit. Don't place confidence in. Don't trust in or listen to what this says. This last part of the definition of believe. To entrust a thing to another. So don't entrust anything to them, especially yourself. Jeremiah 23 verse 16 says this. This is what the Lord of armies says. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They tell a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. If it ain't coming from the mouth of the Lord, don't go. Don't even listen. Don't entrust anything to them at all. Make sense? This is how we should respond. So again, how do we navigate this? If it ain't about Jesus, it's about nothing. If a message even that I preach doesn't lead you to Jesus in some way, if, it, if it's not coming from the, the finished work of Jesus Christ, do not listen. As a matter of fact, if you start hearing repetitive messages as such, don't come back. Just for the record. Because pastors lost his marbles. <laughs> I mean, that just that, that's a public accountability. You follow me? It's like, no. I'm just learning personally, just a side personal testimony and note, is that I'm learning, especially during today, the gospel is so simple so practical that a child sitting can hear it and learn it and says, I got that. Makes total sense to me. And it doesn't need to be all deep. If the gospel is for everyone, why do we try to make it so deep? Oh, well, you know, the stars are... It, it's almost like we just, we, we just lose the simplicity Right, it was so simple when we came to know Jesus. Why is now has it now become so complex for other people to come to know Jesus? Personal gain. Something we're trying to get from you. That doesn't belong to us. Let me close with this. So I did this quick research on 
How many end of the world predictions have there been? <laughs> Here's some predictions. In the first millennium itself, there were 11. From the 11th to the 15th century, seven. The 16th century alone had 13. 17th century, 15. The 18th century, 13. The 19th century, 16 predictions that the end was coming. The 20th century, 61. <laughs> the 21st century, 22. And I'm sure it's counting because it, it goes on. So out of this, you, you can calculate there was either, there was 158 people or organizations who somehow predicted that the end of the world was coming. Wrong. Matter of fact, it gets better. There's these far future predictions, they say, in the, set, in the 22nd and 23rd centuries, there's already been like three. Some say it's going to happen in the year 300,000. <laughs> Some say it gets better, 100 million years. Someone says the year 500 and to, between 500 and 600 million. Someone even <laughs> said... One to, five year, year, one to five billion years from now, the end is coming. <laughs> right? It's like, okay, it's going to happen one day. <laughs> but as you can see, we're just fishing, 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 and wasting precious time. That can be used to, Lord, make me more like Jesus before he returns. Amen. Help me make others more like Jesus before he returns. Let me end with this quote. It says, therefore, to be a Christian is to honor ambiguity. It requires a willingness to, be in, to endure mystery and to admit that there are limits to human knowledge. God has us on a need-to-know basis. And there is much, it seems, we don't need to know. <laughs> Let's pray. Uh, Father, we're so thankful that you just keep stuff away from us. And honestly, I've learned over the years, it's good for my soul. God, I can't even imagine if I knew when you were coming back, how would I act, what would I do, what would I say, what would I be thinking. But, Lord, you've put us all on a need-to-know basis. Right now, we just don't need to know when you're coming back. But we do need to know that you're coming back soon. Either you're coming back to get us, your church, or one day we will stand in front of you to be judged righteously. At the end of the day, if it's now or later, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we'll be a people who are ready. Help us to be ready, God. Help us to spend more time being ready, making sure the wedding dress is prepared for his bride making sure we're washed clean on the inside. But today there may be someone who says, hey, pastor, I don't think I'm ready at all. In other words, maybe you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ in his finished work. Well, that is actually the first step of being ready. If you never admitted that you're a sinner, you never asked Jesus to come in, uh, to wash you clean of your sins and to come into your heart, as Lord and Savior through the power of his Holy Spirit and to live and rule and reign and lead and guide you all the days of your life, maybe that's the starting point for you. If you never prayed this prayer before, I'd like to lead you in this prayer and it goes like this. Just say, Jesus, forgive me because I realize that I've been doing things my own way. I have sinned against you. But today, Jesus, I realize that 
You came to die for me personally. You were buried for me personally. And you rose again from the grave for me personally. Jesus, please come into my heart, my life, to wash me clean and rule and reign through the power of your Holy Spirit. Please lead me and guide me all the days of my life that I may bring you honor and glory until I see you face to face. And can all of us now stand, please, if you can. If you lift your hands with me, please. Lord, we just lift our hands to you today just as a sign of submission and neediness. Lord, we need you desperately. Lord, we know that it is not by might. We know that it is not by power. All these things we learn today. So we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you'll enable us to live for you in a way that we're not tricked by the enemy, but Lord, that we'll stay true to the cause of Christ, and that Christ will remain the centerpiece, the purpose, the focus, the end game of all of our lives. Take us into the highways and the byways, my God, compelling people to come in. Help us to reach our friends, our families, total strangers, that your house may be filled. Lord, put a hedge of protection around us to protect us from any attacks of the enemy. And Lord, we'll be quick to give you all the honor and the glory that you deserve. In the magnificent name of Jesus Christ, we all said, amen. Can we give them a hand clap? Thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. If you're ever in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey region, we hope to see you in person. But for now, please tune in next week here at Commitment Online.